Hi guys, uh, welcome to the 8th lecture of Galactic Dynamics lecture series. So just to recap a bit, in last lecture, we studied orbits in axis symmetric potential. So the kind of potentials in which uh, uh, the pot potential or the mass distribution, it's independent of azimuthal angle. So if you rotate your mass distribution, uh, around Z axis in phi direction, the azimuthal direction, you do not get any change in the dynamics, right? So it's axis symmetric potential. And just to uh, study it in a little bit more of detail, we also applied epicycle approximation because we know from our observations that the stars in the disk, for example, are not exactly on a circular orbit in the galaxy, uh, in the Milky Way or in any other galaxy for that matter, we know that there is a little bit of deviation from circular orbit in stars and that little bit deviation is accounted as by saying that they are on an epicycle instead of on a cycle on a perfect circular path. So we also studied the epicycle approximation where the circular, we give a little deviation from the circular orbit radius, which is RG, and we add a little delta X to RG and say, okay, let's study what happens now. And then we obtain the epicycle. And even our sun, it's on an epicyclic motion. Though it's circular velocity, it's 220 kilometers per second, but that's just an epicyclic transversal velocity. Okay. So today we would study a little bit deviation. So basically by this deviation, we are bring, we are coming more closer to the realistic picture because nothing in this world is ideal, right? Nothing is perfect. Nothing is ideal. Nature doesn't like being perfect or being, you know, just very simple and precise and elegant, at least not at the observational level. So uh, it's a little bit, so nature, it's a mixture of, you know, this thing and that thing so nothing it's very smoothly defined so we need to deviate ourselves from little toy models that we first study to get a basic understanding of the subject and then we keep making it more and more complicated so we get so we get as near as possible to the best picture that defines our systems so today we will study orbits in planar but non-axis symmetric potential. So by non-axis symmetric potential, I mean that if you have your mass distribution and you hold it in your uh, hand and you rotate it about Z axis, you would see that uh, the distribution is, is not invariant under, under rotation. So the distribution varies as you rotate around the Z axis. So it's non-axis symmetric potential. And in fact, in reality, most of the galaxies are non-axis symmetric, right? So they are triaxial. So triaxial is something that I would bring up in more detail in the next lecture. This lecture is going to be a pretty short one and there is not much of content, but it's a conceptual, right? So just, uh, so let's consider a random potential to, to explain the non-axis symmetric potential. So let's consider this potential phi xy. So it's an xy plane given by half v naught square natural log of rc square plus x square plus y square over q square where q where q uh, sets that how far our potential is being from axis symmetric potential so for example if q is 1 so the, the q will basically hide in this equation right if q is 1 and you get a you know you get a perfect uh, axis symmetric potential right but if q takes value so q is always less than equal to one uh, of course it, it should not be zero otherwise this would just blow up but so if q is less than equal to one and as q varies uh one would notice that there is it's so our potential it's not it would not be exactly circular in x y plane it would be a little elliptical and there would be little eccentricity in the potential not in the orbit guys in the potential right for orbits, we'll have to really, really go in much more detail. Now, if I take the spatial derivative of, if I basically take the gradient of this potential, 
uh, I would get some function of b of, of some function b in x and y that you can calculate of course that would be multiplied by x i cap plus y over q square j cap so basically the gravitation field it's in i and j direction right so uh, I have plotted a little graph for such a potential so this graph over here is for the potential that I've shown on the previous slide for this potential, but for the parametric value RC equals 0.14, V0 equals 1, and Q equals 0.5. And this plot over here, it's for RC equals 0.14, V0 equals 1, and Q equals 1 again. So RC basically sets the radius scale and V0 here sets the circular velocity scale, right? So these are the parameters that one attaches to the model that we are dealing with. So on the x-axis, it's, it's of course x space component. On the y-axis, it's y space component. And the colors basically suggest, so this color, so the darkest part of the potential, it's minus 2. The blue, it's minus 1.5 minus 1, the greenish, it's between minus 0 0.5 and 0 0.5, and the red one, it's 2. So basically, it's an auxiliary plot, right? It's a density plot that tells you that where the potential is maximum and where it is minimum. And as you can already see, for Q equals 1, the potential, it's axis symmetric, right? So because if I rotate, so you can imagine, so since, since X is on the X axis, Y is on the Y axis, you can imagine a Z axis passing through your screens to the other side of the screen. And now if you rotate this potential over here about that Z axis that is passing. So the Z axis is passing from your eyes through your laptop screen, right? It's perpendicular to the screen of your uh, computer systems or mobile if you're watching it in a mobile. So if you rotate, the system about that z axis you notice for q equals 1 case that there there would be no um, change in the distribution of uh, in the potential model if you rotate it about z axis but in this case if you rotate it right so for a given radius if you rotate it that radius would experience a different potential here than it was experiencing here so there is an elongation along x-axis than at the y-axis, right? So th this is a non-axis symmetric potential case. And here I have plotted it for q equals 0.5. Yes, so uh, one of the things, so uh, again, uh, we would try and see uh, how this potential behaves in the extreme cases. So for example, for radius defined by under root x square plus y square, of course. So if you are in the plane, uh, in if you are in the z equals zero plane, in the approximation where radius defined by under root x square plus y square, so if the radius is much, much less than RC, the radius uh, scale that we said, in that case, the potential can be ex expressed or expanded as this term over here. So this I'm leaving it as an exercise. Uh, this can be done uh, since you already know the Taylor expansion of log of one plus X. So try doing that since R is much, much less than RC. You can take RC common out and then the X squared plus Y squared over Q squared divided by RC it would be, and then you can expand and check that the expression that, that you get is something like this. So in, in the limit where RC is much, much greater than the radius, so in that case, the potential equals V0 square over 2RC square multiplied by X squared plus Y square over Q squared plus constant. But we never care about the constant because, you know, constant can be set by hand and it doesn't really affect the orbital motion apart from it might scale it up or down, but, but that's it. Now, as you, uh, as you might have already noticed that this term over here represents a two-dimensional harmonic potential, right? So our harmonic potential, if you can recall, goes as half k x squared plus y squared, right? Except that we have this non-symmetric term over here that would uh, cause force in the x direction to be different than the force in the y direction at, at the same time. So had q been equal to 1, 
So at the very same time, the force along the x-axis would have been equal to the force along the y-axis, but because of this Q, now that force would be different, right? So, uh, so this potential represents a two-dimensional harmonic potential, which means that the orbit would have a certain kind of oscillations attached to them and as it is actually seen in our observations, right? So this was one extreme case. The second extreme case is if the radius, if your star happens to lie much, much further away than the RC, the radius scale that you set, and if Q is equal to one, in that case, uh, phi equals V naught square log of R. And this, of course, uh, as you might recall that the circular velocity formula is VC square equals R d phi by dr. This would give you a constant circular speed. So this will help you in obtaining a flat rotation curve at very larger radii as you want it. So basically uh, the model here I'm presenting is that should serve for a Milky Way galaxy type model where stars which are closer to the galaxy have certain kind of oscillations attached to them. And as you move out further away from the galaxy, you get a flat rotation curve. It is not the model that people usually use, but it's a very nice, nice and simple approximation. Right? Now for uh, R, much, much less than RC, where we already know that there is certain kind of oscillations produced in the stars, we can already say that the frequency in, uh, in the X direction would be V naught over RC, and the frequency attached to the oscillation of star in the Y direction would be V naught over QRC by the analogy that if uh, potential, uh, be, because we know that if the potential is half K X squared plus Y squared, then in that case, the omega becomes under root K by M simply. So we can make this analogy and compare it with this, compare the potential in hand with this case that we are already aware of. And then we can draw these solutions for frequency out from from this consideration. Now note that the orbits are superposition of independent harmonic oscillations, right? Since there is no x, y term, there is just x square plus y square. So the, uh, the uh, oscillations are independent in x and y direction. Had there been an x, y term or an x square, y square term or something like that, then the uh, forces and oscillation would have been more complicated and the frequencies would not have been independent of each other, right? But here we are a little lucky because we're dealing with much simpler potentials, right? So for Q equal to one case, the omega X would have been equal to omega Y, right? So both the frequencies in X and, the X and Y direction would have been equal, but not necessarily if Q takes some value other than one, right? So in the image, I'm showing that how would it look? So suppose we have a situation where Q equals 0 0.5. This means that the omega in the X direction, the frequency in the X direction equals, would be half times the frequency in the Y direction. So in the time, a star moves, uh, makes an oscillation in, in the X direction twice, it would only make an oscillation in the y direction just once, right? And you get an orbit which looks something complicated. And such orbits are, are called box orbits because they have no sense of re revolution about the center. They're just, they're just closer to the center because R is much, much less than RC. So these such orbits uh, happen to take place, such complicated trajectories happen to take place when they are much closer to the center of the system and they have no sense of revolution. So these stars do not revolve about the center. They just make these random oscillations near to the center and such orbits are called box orbits because they represent, they look like a rectangle. I mean, they just, they are just conf confined to this hypothetical rectangular box. Right. At larger radii, however, we get loop orbits. So uh, since uh, I already showed you in the approximation that phi L, so in the approximation when R is, R is much, much less greater than RC, I'm sorry, the potential becomes V naught square log of R. 
And now if I write the Lagrangian for this potential, uh, the Lagrangian would be this, where this is the kinetic energy term minus the potential energy term. And the kinetic energy is basically in a plane where R is the radius and psi is the azimuthal angle. So the equation of motion uh, using Euler-Lagrangian equation of motion would be of this form. So this is something that we've already done before, right? So the orbit at very large radii looks something like this, right? So they are not exactly circular, but they are analysts. So these orbits are defined, are confined within some minimum radius circle and some maximum radius circle. So they are defined in this ring. And the width of this ring is depends on the initial tangential velocity, which makes sense, right? So suppose the initial tangential velocity of some star sitting here happens to be very large. So it would make these large uh, rosette type orbits around it. So the, so the analyst would, width would be very large. But in fact, if the initial tangential velocity was just zero, in that case, it should almost be perfect. In fact, it should perfectly fall on some circle given by radius r, right? So the initial tangential velocity determines the width of the analyst uh, to which star is confined, right? So these are the two extreme possibilities that we just studied about the potential half v naught square natural log of rc squared plus x squared plus y squared over q squared. Now let's solve a new... Uh, 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 a numerical, which is not based on this, but this is based on some formula, some derivation that we did a couple of lectures back. And please do not look at the solution right now, otherwise there's no point of trying out this uh, numerical. So for what spherical symmetric potential is, posi is possible trajectory this? Radius equals A times exponential B to the power psi where psi is the azimuthal angle, A and B are just some constants, and R is the radius. So pause this video for a second, give, this self, give yourself uh, some time to think over it and try and do it. And if you've made notes, try and look to your notes um, and see if you can solve it. So I hope you paused the video and gave it a try. In case you did not or you could not, let's go over the solution like always. So r equals a over uh, r equals a times exponential b to the power psi. So one of the things to note here is that suppose b is positive and a has to be positive of course because radius are always positive quantities and suppose if b is positive this means that as this as the trajectory increases in azimuthal angle the radius also increases right? So as psi increases, radius increases. But if b happens to be negative, in that case, as psi increases, the radius decreases exponentially, right? So these are the two. So uh, this happens to be a little weird. So basically, if b is positive, the potential is somewhat like a repulsive potential, right? Because as psi increases, the radius would, would increase, which means that it's sort of repulsive potential. And if B is negative, then as psi increases, the radius decreases, which means in that case, it should be a little bit of attractive potential. But let's not talk about B right now. We'll just solve, we'll just maintain B throughout our solution and let's, we'll have a look at it in the end later if required. So here, in the first step, I'm taking, I'm considering one over r squared times dr by d psi. So I take the derivative of this term over here and I get this. And I hope you guys are aware of derivative. So a of, e, so I get back a times e to the power b psi, which is basically r over r squared times b. r r gets cancelled and I get b, b over r, which is basically b over a to the power b psi. Then I multiply the term I have just obtained with L square over R square times I take the D over D side derivative of this term which was which I had in the previous step. 
and taking hell from the right hand side of the previous step, I obtain L square over R square D D psi of B over A to the power B psi. And now this exponential would go up and the power of exponential would become negative. A would A is a constant would come out of derivative and I would end up with minus L square B square over R to the power Q. But we already know from our previous lectures that L square over R square D D psi 1 over R square DR over D psi equals FR plus L square over RQ. So guys, the thing is that we want to find the spherical symmetric potential corresponding to this trajectory. So basically I wanted this term so that I can get my force and I know that how force is related to potential. So that's why I wanted to calculate this term over here. So I already know this formula from my previous derivation. So I just substitute now in place on LHS, I substitute minus L square B square over R cube, which equals force plus L square over R cube. Now force, of course, just only depends on R since we are dealing with spherical potential. So FR, which is equals minus D5 by DR, we know from elementary classes, in this particular case equals minus L square over R cube times B square plus one. This means that the potential equals minus L square over 2R square B square plus 1. So this is the potential that corresponds to the trajectory given in this case. So uh, just to uh, bring this chapter to an end and we'll be starting something very, very, very interesting and very, very, very realistic. Uh, in the next lecture series so uh, I just want to I just wanted to bring this chapter to an end by saying that the situation is much more complicated guys uh, because the studies that we have done so far are somewhat very basic which is of course required to establish certain concepts which are required to get acquainted with the ideas or with the kind of things that we are dealing with right you just cannot expect anybody to jump directly into complicated situations you make your toy models you start with simple situation to get some hands-on experience and to get to know that you know what exactly you're dealing with but the situation is much more complicated guys because you may so is our milky way spherically symmetric is our milky way axis symmetric is our milky way uh, planar but non-axis symmetric is our milky way log following a logarithmic profile is our Milky Way following a Keplerian profile it's much more complicated because our Milky Way has a bar it has spiral arms it has bulge it has thin disk it has thick disk it has interstellar medium it has what not it our galaxy it's a beautiful for me it's our galaxy it's very beautiful because in fact it has everything right so here is an edge on view of our galaxy so 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 the extent so the diameter of our galaxy is approximately 30 kiloparsecs, right? And about 8 kiloparsecs away from the center of the galaxy, we have our sun sitting somewhere over here. So our uh, Milky Way galaxy has a bulge, right? So the Sagittarius uh, black hole sits somewhere at the center and surrounded by it are the S type stars, which are in pathetically random and abrupt motion just going around this black hole then we have a bar that is not presented in this uh, image i'm sorry about that but we have a bar that really really spoils the situation okay uh, then we have spiral arm which again is not visible in this picture then we have the disc but we have a thin disc and we have a th thick disc and then we have the halo guys the dark matter halo that could be spherical that could be triaxial it's not still known the studies are going on right now and i would talk more about the dark matter halo maybe in the next coming up lectures and there then there are globular clusters sitting all over around our galaxies which are basically a spheroidal stellar population corresponding to a single population and these globular clusters are basically laboratories uh, where uh, which give us a lot of information about the age of the galaxy and about the accretion history of the galaxy and whatnot. Uh, but a time comes when one needs to formulate the theory and the model, but it's no more 
possible to solve things analytically, right? So one needs help from numerical techniques and numerical integration and numerical differentiation, graph plotting and etc. Uh, because a time comes when it becomes hard to perform analytic studies. Then it's a situation that's much more complicated because there are Lindblad resonances which is caused due to weak bars, approximation potential, and then there is rotating potential. Uh, and our Milky Way, it's definitely rotating because it's inferred from the rotational curve, the velocity curve that we already know of, that since our velocity curve becomes flat at larger radii, this means the stars are rotating at that speed, right? This means our Milky Way galaxy, it, it has a rotation, it is moving as a bulk, so it has a rotation. So we haven't considered rotational potential so far. So it's very, very complicated and it gets out of hand and but it's beautiful at the same time because you need to take care of so many stuff and it brings you closer to the to the real picture so uh in the next lecture uh i would definitely bring something uh, i'll start a new chapter which would be very interesting and i hope you had fun during this lecture as well thanks